Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Dimitri. I am your host here on this little show. And today I'd like to share with you um, a one chapter, part of the chapter, major part of the chapter of an audiobook, the freshly published audiobook, which is called Agile Ceremonies, the details you were missing. Yes, we all miss some details as freshly baked Scrum Masters, even Agile coaches in some cases. So this ebook and audiobook publication is there to answer a very, uh, very kind of uh, frequently recurring question of how to run certain ceremonies, what details to pay attention to. Today, to my dedicated audience of people who have subscribed, who have shown their interest, and I encourage you, if you are just visiting for the first time, to join our little club here, show your support, subscribe to the channel right now. So I'd like to share with you this fairly exclusive preview of, um, of a chapter of an audiobook that hopefully will answer some of the questions you might have and give you a taste of what else is there in store. As you can see in the background as well, joinagile.com had a slight redesign and it kind of uh, right now is um, uh, leading with the information of what Join Agile initiative really stands for. Before, it kind of conveyed fairly in a narrow way, conveyed the fact that we are working with the recruiters and we're trying to create a service. The service is already there to uh, ensure that the companies make more educated hiring decisions. Right now, I'm just bringing to the forefront yet again, especially to people who are maybe less familiar with what I do and what Join Agile stands for, is the fact that it is a place where you can educate yourself further, create more of a competitive spirit in yourself and knowledge base that will allow you to stand above the competition on the job market. You educate yourself, you optionally certify yourself because that always reinforces your professional profile and then you get hired. You get one of those agile jobs. That's what all these books, all these publications, all these videos that I'm publishing for you here are about. That's it for now. Please enjoy, subscribe here if you haven't already and I will speak to you next time. Sprint planning. Sprint planning is one of the better known and most important ceremonies coming to us from the Scrum framework. While any Agile practitioner worth their money would immediately correct me here, saying that all of the Scrum ceremonies are important and were introduced for a good reason, some are skipped less frequently than others. Keeping it real, as I try to do in all of my books, I have to say that sometimes the bad practices, such as bastardizing Scrum and skipping some ceremonies, actually highlights what's perceived as adding the most and least value for the customer and the Scrum team itself. Using this environmental awareness as an Agile coach, for example, could give you a lot of valuable information, helping create your coaching plans and generally determine the condition your transforming delivery environment is in. Sprint planning is a classic example of an unavoidable and all-important Agile ceremony that we'll take a very close look at in this chapter. Main goals of any sprint planning are to discuss what the product owner would like done over the next sprint, commit to what appears achievable, confirm the sprint goal, and formally start the sprint as a team. The timing of the ceremony varies based on how long the sprint is. Scrum Guide explains this part rather well, recommending to spend up to 8 hours planning the 4-week sprint. Realistically, you'd probably never run into this situation. With some exceptions, if you're looking at the body of work that is being delivered using Scrum Framework, while requiring the full 4 weeks to create a demonstrable and valuable product increment, chances are this work could be broken down much better. This could also mean that some extra attention is required to the Scrum team's composition, but we are not going to deviate too much from the main topic of this chapter. The key secret to keeping your team focused and efficient during sprint planning is preparation. Certain activities that precede the sprint planning, such as the backlog refinement session that we've discussed in the previous chapter, are usually reducing the amount of complexity, the number of unknowns, and therefore the required duration of the sprint planning itself. Before we go through the exact steps involved in running a good sprint planning session, I'll briefly mention some anti-patterns that I've observed and would like you to be aware of. Those usually stem from the level of professional maturity of the facilitator, 
or the overall willingness of the team to follow the proper process. For example, a classroom-trained Scrum Master who lacks practical experience might religiously stick to the key points from the Scrum Guide, making their team jump through all the formal hoops they never really needed, while another Scrum Master who never really had proper training or motivation and time to invest in their additional Agile education would likely skip some of the essential elements such as setting a sprint goal. Regardless of what's happening out there in the Agile Wild West, that is far too common behind many closed corporate doors, here we'll go through what I consider an efficient sprint planning meeting, given your preparation for the session. So how to prepare? Make sure that you've helped your product owner with the facilitation of a backlog refinement session that the whole development team participated in. Book a room that comfortably fits the whole team and won't feel too small or lacking air if you have to spend a couple of hours in there. Do not attempt sprint planning in open spaces, as tempting as it might be, until you know your team very well and the process is happening almost automatically, with everyone knowing their roles, the body of work being reviewed and similar factors. If your Scrum team is not fully cross-functional and consists of the specialists whose capacity would have to be determined individually during the session, a whiteboard with some markers will help you visualize the process for everyone a little better. I strongly recommend having a large screen or a projector that could be used to display the product and sprint backlogs for everyone to see and easily comment on. The process. There are several ways to run a good sprint planning in my view, but I'll give you only two variations that would work well following the process of backlog refinement that we've already looked at in this book. The two variants I'll offer you here are the sprint planning including team capacity calculation and an easier one without any capacity considerations. Both processes flow quite similarly, but the easier one doesn't require a few extra optional steps that I'll clearly outline for you. Step number one, review and account for any incomplete items of the current sprint. Some highly efficient Scrum teams that manage to plan the work conservatively, not overcommit and complete all of the backlog items by the time the sprint review of the current sprint happens would naturally skip this step. The majority of Scrum teams that I've observed in the real world choose to reconcile and properly close off the sprint as the first item on their sprint planning agenda. You as the facilitator would encourage the product owner and developers to take a quick look at each item of the team's Scrum board and confirm those as not started, started but incomplete or even started but obsolete, so discarded. This is usually fluid and unstructured discussion that you should encourage as the facilitator, keeping track of time and not letting the team go deep into overanalyzing a particular item at this stage. Ultimately, any unfinished items would return to the product backlog for reprioritization and possible acceptance into the next sprint. A very common mistake that I see among fresh practitioners is the assumption that any unfinished item gets automatically allocated and accepted into the next sprint. This is not the case. Everything is subject to renegotiation. Step number two. Close the current sprint. After a quick discussion surrounding any unfinished or discarded items, the current sprint is usually formally closed and the whole team looks at the high-level stats and numbers as the snapshot of their performance. Depending on the collaboration tool or method your Scrum team uses to visualize and track the work, one would expect to be able to see clear numbers of how many stories and tasks were completed versus the overall number of those planned. Burn down chart and velocity tracking should be something on your radar as well, as long as the team has been estimating the relative size of the items they've been delivering to date. How many story points worth of work did the team complete should be the main question people would ask themselves. Step number three, optional. Calculate the capacity of your team. Some teams simply review the list of backlog items that the product owner nominated as the most valuable and highest priority to be addressed during the next sprint 
and then use their subjective judgment and perhaps prior experience to determine how many of those items they'd be able to complete in the next sprint. This optional step addresses a very common situation where, first, the prior historically proven velocity of the team is not known, so committing to any volume of work over the next sprint without calculating the actual capacity of the development team would be nothing more than a guess. And second, the team isn't cross-functional and its capacity can't be treated as one large bucket to put the sprint backlog into. Individual developers would deal with specialization-based duties and therefore need to clearly indicate and commit to their available capacity to do this type of work over the upcoming sprint. I'd suggest to keep it simple until you've gotten to know the team better and perhaps determined a more optimal way that suits you and the team better than the process described below. Create a table or matrix of names of your team members who will be doing the work, developers and testers, clearly indicating their specialization or capability and leaving some space next to them to fill in their capacity for the upcoming sprint. Then, unsurprisingly, ask the team members if they have any leave plans or perhaps some other responsibilities that would distract them from their core duties as a Scrum team member. Yes, we all know as Agile practitioners that any part-time allocation of developers to a Scrum team is highly undesirable or might even appear unagile. But we also know that it's often the reality we have to deal with. So instead of being in a sulky denial of an agile purist, recognize that this is a solid workaround and perhaps a bridging solution towards the state of increased agility. For each team member, write down the number of days that they expect to be able to contribute to this sprint. Having this capacity matrix at your disposal and transparently available to your whole Scrum team will make the rest of your planning process a lot more educated. Step number four, optional as well, establish a normalized estimation scale. For brand new Scrum teams that don't have a historical record of their velocity or story points estimation practice, and especially where capacity planning is required due to the lack of cross-functionality, it is a good idea to baseline and normalize the perception of what one story point means to everyone. While story points estimation system based on Fibonacci sequence of numbers is intended to serve as a relative abstraction layer from the world of absolute numbers, such as minutes, hours and days, it is often a good idea to rig the system in favor of making it easier to adopt among traditional software development teams. A lot of traditional developers find it easier to estimate work effort in something more tangible like days. So in this optional approach that requires some suitability assessment from you as the facilitator, we will help the team drive clear parallels between the story points and calendar days. I suggest using a whiteboard to write the following in large block letters at the top of it. One story point equals one day of work for one developer. Explain who is classified as a developer, if required. Reiterate that any work efforts that you'll be calculating should be considered as end-to-end, -end, not just the coding part, but everything that it would take to turn a user story into a piece of valuable functionality that's integrated with the rest of the code and possibly deployed into the required environment. The extent of completion requirements for any piece of work should be clearly understood and documented by the whole team in the form of the definition of done. You might need to additionally clarify that the work effort could be shared between the developers of the team if the story has to exchange hands in the process of its development. You'd naturally see this happen more rarely when the Scrum team is properly cross-functional, when every developer could do virtually any job, and more often when you're dealing with the team of narrow domain specialists. Step number five, optional. Establish the measuring stick user story. Another important yet optional step is to make sure that the whole team understands what specific task or user story could serve as that mental measuring stick that's worth one day of work or one story point before attempting to estimate the rest of the sprint backlog. 
This is obviously applicable to situations where you, as the facilitator, still expect your Scrum team to estimate work items relative to each other, rather than absolutely, with no attempted comparison to the rest of the backlog. It is widely known and promoted in the Agile practice that we as humans are much quicker and more accurate when sizing up things relative to one another, rather than attempting to guess the exact size of an object or duration of a certain event. This notion is at the heart of the classic Agile estimation approach, where story points are used to label those relatively compared pieces of work that the development team is presented with. It ensures that no excessive guesswork is attempted, as it has no value in itself. All we're trying to do here is guess how much we'll be able to do in the next sprint, and then have some sort of a baseline and a system that would allow us to see the growing or decreasing performance of the whole team as the time goes by. In order to estimate relatively, regardless of the measurement units used, story points or the actual days, the team would need to agree on what's the easiest and quickest, yet not trivial piece of work that they can see in the backlog, and could agree on labeling as a one-pointer. The process of establishing this mental measuring stick is non-prescriptive and depends on the team culture, personalities present and established relationships, 